Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation, the three heads of the department, for organizing this uh, program. Okay, so uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Francesco Carvena and Nico Zigras. Uh, so here is uh, Francesco on the left. Oops, sorry. Francesco on the left, Nico's in the middle. So they were Francesco's in Milan, Nico's in Warwick. Okay, so let me first introduce uh, the model, directed polymer model. So this is a model uh, that is, comes from uh, equilibrium statistical physics with the disorder. So we call it uh, one of the disorder systems. Disorder refers to running environments. So the basic model is uh, the polymer is uh, sort of a mathematical idealization of a polymer. So this is modeled by random walk. So here I introduce a random walk, x sub n, n denotes uh, the time. <coughs> so here's the uh, illustration of random walk uh, in dimension one. So horizontal dimension is time dimension. The vertical dimension the, is the space. So here this is a one dimension space, one dimension time. So you have a random walk, which uh, is, uh, here's a graph of the random walk. The random walk takes nearest neighbor steps. So every time it looks at one of the 2D neighbors and takes one of these 2D positions with equal probability. So that's the random walk, we call simple symmetric random walk. <coughs> and uh, I would denote use uh, this uh, symbol P to denote probability for this random walk. Now the second ingredient is a collection of ID random variables which represent the so-called disorder or random environments. So what we do is that for each point in space-time lattice, I put an ID random variable, independent identically distributed random variable, omega nx, n for time, x for space. So these random variables are assumed to be independent with the same distribution, mean zero, variance equal to one, and we also assume that they are finite uh, exponential, they are finite moment generating function. So you take the Laplace transform or the exponential moment of these random variables, and that's assumed to be finite for <coughs> parameters in the whole interval containing the origin. <coughs> now, the omegas is going to play the role of the running environment or disorder. So what we do is that we fix a realization of the disorder. And then we look at how the random walker's distribution is going to be influenced by the environment. So this is defined through so-called Gibbs measure in statistical physics language. It's a change of measure of the random walk. So we first fix the polymer length. So we only consider the random walker for n steps. I fix the, param uh, the disorder. And then I also introduce a parameter beta. Beta is called the inverse temperature, which uh, governs the strength of interaction between the random walk and the running environment. So what I do is that given this realization of omega, given the length of the polymer or the random walk, given this inverse temperature beta, then I'm going to change the law of the random walk by exponential weight. So Px denotes the probability of each trajectory of the trajectory x. So a priori among all possible trajectories with nearest neighbor steps, every trajectory has the same probability. Now I'm going to modify this by putting exponential weight. So the weight is uh, defined as follows. Given the, uh, given the random walk trajectory, I collect the disorder omegas that you see along the trajectory. And then you weigh it by this exponential factor. The second term is just the normalizing, the second term is the constant term that does not depend on the trajectory. So you can forget about this for the moment. It's for technical reasons we introduce this. Just focus on the first term. The first term says that if the summation of the weights along the trajectory is very large, then because beta is positive, so this is to, going to favor trajectories which visit locations where the omega is large. <coughs> so trajectories which collect a lot of these heavy weights will be rewarded. So they will have more weights, while trajectories which collect a lot of omegas which are negative will be penalized. So that changes the measure of the random walk. Uh, Z omega and beta, that is a normalizing constant which ensures that you still have a probability measure. So it's just defined to be the average, the summation of all these exponential weights, the summation of the weights over all possible trajectories. So in physics language, this is called a partition function. So the word partition function also appears in many other branches of mathematics. <coughs> okay, so this is a model that uh, defines the law of the random walk for a given realization of the disorder. Now what we are interested in is when n is very large, on large uh, spatial time scales, what is the behavior of the random walk under this change of measure? Does it uh, differ significantly from the underlying random walk uh, or not? <coughs> so it turns out that uh, even though the model is very simple, but actually there is an interesting phase transition uh, as I change the parameter beta. Uh, 
So beta is uh, the inverse temperature, just like uh, in like a normal, I mean, the temperature is really what we normally think of as temperature of water or whatever. So the behavior is the following. If a beta is uh, sufficiently small, smaller than the critical value, so this means that the strength of interaction between the running environment and the random walk is weak, weak enough below a certain threshold, then the random walk actually under the polymer measure, so the measure that, that defines this new measure for the random walk, I call it the polymer measure, then for every typical realization of the disorder, what you find is that the polymer measure, under the polymer measure, the random walk is still diffusive. Diffusive means that uh, just like a normal random walk, if I look at uh, what is this displacement of the n steps, then the displacement is typically square root of n times the normal random variable. So that is the central limit here. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you can also replace discrete states uh, time by continuous time, in which case you get a Brownian motion. So that's what is meant by diffusive. Uh, it's uh, displacement at time n is of, of order square root of n. So when the interaction strength is weak enough, then the random walk is still diffusive. So therefore, it's the same as the underlying random walk without disorder. But when the strength of interaction becomes larger than this critical value, then it is uh, conjectured or the, uh, proved in special cases that uh, the random walk becomes super diffusive in the sense that at time n, the position is much, much larger than square root of n. So the exact exponent is not uh, known. In dimension one, spatial dimension one, time dimension one, then it is, uh, so in one plus one, then it is believed that xn under the polymer measure should be roughly n to the power of two thirds. So that has been verified uh, for a class of integrable models. And in fact, uh, this model has a close relation to a random matrix theory, the so-called tracy Witten distribution. So the fluctuation of uh, the log partition function actually is uh, believed to have the same tracy within fluctuation that you see in random matrix theory in spatial dimension one. So the, form, uh, <laughs> the existing of such a critical sort of number is sort of uh, uh, is, is proof a prior uh, or after then or you know. The, the, yeah, exist so the proof that of the existence of critical number, this has been proved. Uh, although there are two different definitions of the critical point and it is still open whether these two definitions agree or not. But uh, there is another way of characterizing the supercritical phase, the, the, the phase which above the critical point. Instead of talking about super diffusivity, you can sample two random walks under the same measure independently. You fix a realization of disorder, now you have a measure on the random walk, now you sample one random walk and you sample another one, and you see that how much they collide with each other. If it is a normal random walk, then up to time n, the number of collisions is uh, much, much smaller than n. Typically in dimension one, the number of collisions up to time n is only of order square root of n. But in this uh, supercritical phase, what you find is that the number of collisions will be proportional to n. So the basic heuristic is that, uh, okay, let me mention also a uh, sort of, uh, special case of this model. The special case of this model is when beta is equal to infinity. Now when beta is equal to infinity, what does this measure become? The measure degenerates. So, Assuming that uh, these omegas are continuous random variables, so no two omegas are the same, then for beta equal infinity, this model becomes uh, degenerates. It becomes a delta measure concentrating on a single trajectory. Because there are only finitely many trajectories to consider up to time n, so there are only finitely many possible summation of weights. And since I said all the omegas, no two omegas are different, then there'll be one trajectory which achieves the maximum weight. And that will be the delta measure so, so, so this measure will become the delta measure concentrating on that particular trajectory. Now this model is called the last passage percolation model, which has been studied uh, quite a lot in the probability literature. And that model, if I look at the last passage time, the maximum weight that you get, the fluctuation of this actually turns out to have tracy within fluctuation, the same as the fluctuation of the largest eigenvalue in the Gaussian uh, unitary ensemble. <clears throat> and uh, this was a big uh, breakthrough by Bike, Dive, Johansson in the, around 2000, that they proved that if the weights are geometrically distributed uh, or exponentially distributed, then the model is integrable and the fluctuation of the last passage time is exactly given by Tracy Witham. But uh, if you consider general omegas, which are not ex geometric or not exponential, then this is a major open problem, how to prove Tracy Witham fluctuation. So beta equal infinity is a special case of this model. Now, if you consider finite uh, beta uh, in dimension one, and you take the log of this uh, partition function, 
then that will be the analog of the last passage time. So that is also believed to have a Tracy Wooden fluctuation. But uh, that has also only been proved uh, for a special model where the weights are log gamma. Then the model is again integrable. So there is no result uh, beyond these uh, integrability models trying to prove this uh, Tracy Wooden fluctuation. <coughs> okay, so it is known that uh, uh, in any dimension there is actually such a transition. So a transition from a diffusive, diffusive behavior to super diffusive behavior. And the super diffusive behavior basically is, comes from the picture that is similar to the last passage percolation. In last passage percolation, you have an optimal trajectory. Now, if the beta is no longer infinity but the finite, then what happens is that the, the tra optimal trajectory becomes a corridor. So your trajectory will fluctuate, but it will fluctuate around this optimal trajectory. So when we sample two independent random walks under the polymer measure, then both of them will lie within this corridor. So they will keep on colliding with each other. So that's why the overlap, the number of collisions of two independently sampled random walks under the same polymer measure will still be of order n. So that is uh, the heuristics. Uh. <coughs> now what is known is that in dimension 1, the critical point is equal to 0. So that's why for any beta that is strictly positive, the behavior should be the same as beta equal to infinity. So that's why the conjecture for Tracy within all this uh, should also uh, hold for finite but positive beta. For dimension 3 and higher, the critical point is now non-trivial. It is a finite, strictly positive number. And for dimension 2, uh, it turns out that the critical value is still equal to 0, but it is a bit different from dimension 1, because the dimension 2 turns out to be the critical dimension. So I mentioned these words, disorder relevance, disorder irrelevance, and the marginal relevance. Uh, so let me explain this uh, briefly. So in dimension 1, why, uh, the reason I call it disorder relevance, uh, so this is language in the disorder systems, is because I, you can think of this uh, polymer measure as a perturbation of the underlying random walk. A priori you have the random walk, there's no disorder, you just have a random walk. But now I add a bit disorder to it, and then the behavior of the random walk may or may not change on large scales. So what you see is that in dimension 1, because the critical value is equal to 0, so as soon as you add some disorder, beta very small but positive, then you see that the macroscopic behavior changes from diffusive to super diffusive the exponent should become two-thirds instead of one-half. So this change of exponents uh, is significant. So it changes this universality class. So we, we call it universality class. So it changes from the diffusive behavior to something completely different as soon as you have disorder perturbation. So that's why if I think of disorder as a perturbation, then this is a relevant perturbation, just like a dynamical system. If you perturb uh, around a fixed point, but in a direction that is unstable, then after you iterate, it just moves away. So that's why it's called a relevant perturbation, disorder relevance. Dimension 3 and higher, what it is known is that if you add a disorder perturbation, but the disorder is weak enough below the critical value, then on large scales, you still have a diffusive behavior. In fact, you can prove that the polymer measure converges to the Wiener measure, same as the Brownian motion. So therefore, in dimension 3 and higher, if you do a perturbation by disorder, it's an irrelevant perturbation. Now dimension 2 is critical because this is a case where it's like a dynamical system where all the directions are sort of the eigenvalues. When you do a perturbation, the eigenvalue is equal to 1. So therefore, you cannot just pick a direction and see if the eigenvalue is less than 1, then it's a sort of a stable perturbation. It's not going to move away. If you pick a direction, the eigenvalue is larger than 1, it's going to move away. While in dimension 2, all directions, the eigenvalue, as far as the disorder perturbation is concerned, the eigenvalue is equal to 1. So you cannot tell from the first term of the eigenvalue expansion whether this is actually going to move away or sort of, can, uh, sort of remain stable. So that's why you have to look at higher order terms. So that's why it's called a marginal case. And for the directed polymer model, disorder perturbation actually is marginally relevant. It means that when you perturb it, it's going to move away. So that's why the critical value is equal to 0 in dimension 2. <coughs> Now, so this is what I was explaining, what is the, the meaning of the notion of disorder relevance versus irrelevance, and why dimension 2 is uh, marginal. <coughs> okay. So let me try to <coughs> say a few, a few more words about this notion of disorder relevance versus irrelevance. So there is a, a long history behind uh, sort of the general theory, the physical theory, understanding of this uh, equilibrium statistical physics. So, uh, 
I mean, there is a, uh, peer physics have been interested in this uh, critical phenomenon. Critical phenomenon in the sense that uh, you have uh, models which undergo phase transition, just like uh, water goes from, uh, from, uh, uh, from liquid to vapor, and, uh, or from solid to, uh, to liquid. So there's one class of transitions where people discover that uh, when you reach the critical point, the correlation length diverges in the sense that uh, sort of uh, uh, what I mean by correlation length is divergence is that if you look at the state of a system, like a density at a point rho of x versus a density at another point rho of y, and you look at the correlation of the density at these two points, then what you find that this decays like a power law, x minus y to some exponent, uh, let me call it eta. Well, there are other cases where this decays like e to the power minus constant times uh, distance. So this case is when we say that uh, there is exponential decay of correlations. And uh, so that is typically a model that we say it's uh, away from criticality. And uh, then there are, so th this case, there is a particular length scale involved. The length scale is given by 1 over c. That is a particular length scale where you see that things decay by a constant factor. But if it is polynomial decay, then you see that there is no such a length scale. So if you try to write it in exponential form, then 1 over c will actually become inf uh, infinity. So there is no intrinsic scale, uh, spatial scale associated with the system. And physics call it uh, the model is sort of self-similar. You can rescale space, you find that this particular form is preserved. So the model is called self-similar. So there's been a lot of work. To, so this, uh, for models at a critical point you are where you, the model is self-similar, these are sort of model called, called, called the models with a continuous uh, phase transition. And there have been a lot of work uh, for, by physicists since the 40s or 30s all the way to the 70s, 80s uh, trying to understand the uh, development of uh, physical theory for this. And this culminated in the work of Ken Wilson, who won the Nobel Prize for his contribution to the development theory of the renormalization group. Renormalization group applied to, uh, to these uh, statistical physics models. Of course, the renormalization group uh, was the first that developed uh, in the context of quantum field theory when they tried to sort of cancel things out, remove infinity. But uh, the, some similar ideas, uh, so Ken Wilson sort of developed, uh, so took, took inspiration, inspiration from that, but uh, developed something completely different and uh, in the context of statistical physics. So, what I want to say is that, uh, so in statistical, in statistical physics language, what does renormalization group transformation refer to? Well, I mentioned this uh, sort of scale-free property. When you look at things on different scales, then you see the model has the same feature, where the model is at a critical point. So renormalization group uh, transformation just means that if I have a model defined on the lattice, on the spatial lattice, then suppose that you have initially 1, 0 at each point, 1, 0, 0, 1, etc, etc. Then what you can do is that you can do a coarse graining, namely that I take, a, say, a 3 by 3 block and I define new variable on this 3 by 3 block, either 0 or 1. So one way to do it, you, there are many different ways to do it. One way is that I count how many 1s are there, how many zeros are there. If there are more, than, more 1s than zeros, and then I define this whole block to be 1. So that is called a coarse graining uh, procedure. Then you do it all for all 3 by 3 blocks. Then you can repeat it, zoom out again, group a three of the three by three blocks again, and then you look at how many ones are there, how many zeros there are there, you define new variable one. So this is like a sort of try to gradually zoom out. You have an initial lattice, but as you zoom out, things become more blurry. So therefore, the feature changes. So this uh, coarse graining defines this uh, so-called renormalization group transformation. Now, what is special at a critical point is that if the model is at a critical point uh, for a continuous phase transition, then it is scale free. This means that no matter on what scale you look at, especially if you look at it from further and further away, where the lattice sort of becomes continuum, then what you see is something that in the end is non-trivial. And actually it does not, uh, yeah, you get something non-trivial. So that is the typical feature of a model with a continuous phase transition, that as you zoom out, then uh, the model sort of uh, converges to some non-trivial limit. <coughs> so, this zooming out procedure is actually a semi-group. It's a semi-group on the space of models. So if I redefine the 3 by 3 block by 1s and zeros, this defines the new statistical physics model. And uh, if you re repeat this procedure, then you're actually doing a semi-group, performing a semi-group iteration on the space of models. 
So as a, as a dynamic system on the space of models, then you can analyze what is the critical point and what is the, whether the critical point is stable or not stable, whether the fixed point is stable or not stable. And uh, so that's the whole theory of this uh, renormalization group by Ken Wilson, is to basically formulate uh, these critical points of these the statistical physics models in this language of dynamical system in the space of models. <coughs> Now, if you are away from the critical point, if you look at a model which is not at the critical point and you zoom out, then what you find is that it converges to a trivial point. Namely that for these ones and zeros, what you find is that eventually it's all one or eventually it's all zero. It's only at the critical point where the model is scale free, then you see that even in the limit, you still get something that is non-trivial. So for, there is one special case, uh, so okay, now here we are interested in a model where we are doing disorder perturbation. So this means that if I perform the same procedure, coarse graining, I zoom out, then as I zoom out, which equivalently you can think of make the lattice spacing smaller, right? Instead of zooming out, you can also make the lattice spacing, spacing smaller. And then what happens is that uh, if you make the lattice spacing smaller or you zoom out, then you get new models where the effective strength of the disorder also changes. So that's in the context of uh, this uh, renormalization transformation in the context of uh, disorder systems. When you zoom out, then it affects the model in terms of its effective disorder strength. Now disorder relevance means that as you zoom out, the effective strength of disorder actually blows up as you keep on iterating. Zooming out, uh, iterating, look at how the disorder strength changes, then it blows up. So that's what we call disorder perturbation is relevant. Disorder irrelevance means that as you zoom out, the effect of disorder gets weaker and weaker. So in the limit, you get the same thing as if you didn't put disorder at all. And the marginal case is you cannot determine a priori. You have to look at sort of uh, at the finer details. So uh, there's one simple case you can actually see the effect of this uh, zooming out, this rescaling. How does it affect the disorder? So at a formal level, uh, you can look at uh, the stochastic heat equation. So this is a modification of the heat equation with a disorder term. You have a beta, which is the parameter, just like the inverse temperature. You have the solution, and then you multiply it by the space-time wide noise. So space-time wide noise means that uh, there is some randomness at each space-time point, and at different space-time points, the, independent, the randomness is independent of each other, heuristically. So formally, if I zoom out uh, from uh, on the diffusive scale, so this means I define a new solution, where one unit of time for my new solution is actually epsilon to the power minus two units of time for the old solution. One unit of time in the space uh, coordinate for the new solution is epsilon to the power minus one units of space in the old uh, solution. So this is really zooming out on the diffusive scale. Now you can check that the solution, I mean this utilda, the new solution, satisfies the following equation. Everything is the same. Uh, Ksi can be replaced by a new space-time wide noise Ksi say, tilde. But then the strength of the noise changes to beta times this power of epsilon. Now you see that in dimension one, this power of epsilon, where epsilon is supposed to go to zero, uh, corresponding to zooming out, zooming out further and further, now in dimension one, this prefactor actually blows up. So the effective strength of the noise actually blows up as you zoom out. In dimension three and higher, the effective strength of the noise actually goes to zero. While in dimension two, this term disappears, so you cannot tell. It looks as if it's the same as before. So this is a special case, at least at the heuristic level. You can see that uh, how the disorder affects the system as you rescale in space and time, as you zoom out in space and time. Okay, so now when you try to make sense of this solution, in general, it is not so simple. Because psi here is space-time wide noise, so that is actually a generalized function. It is not a function. So uh, when you define a solution like that, uh, when you have a term like psi like that, then the solution itself will have the same regularity. Maybe it, more, uh, maybe it change a little bit, but it will have the same general regularity as psi, so that u, again, is a generalized function. Now when you look at the equation, you have the product of two generalized functions, and that is something that is hard to make sense of. So that's where the theory of regularity structure by Martin Harrow came in. So Martin Harrow developed a general theory to look at, uh, try to make sense of solutions of such a singular SPDs where you have uh, products of two generalized functions. So he got a field medal for his work on this. And since then, there have been alternative series developed by M. Keller, Gubinelli, Pekovsky, Gonsalves, and uh, Hara, Gubianen, all for such a single SPDs. But uh, all these uh, results, all these series are restricted to 
for this uh, stochastic heat equation, they are restricted to dimension one, to the so-called disorder relevant case. Uh, there is a fundamental reason for this, because in the language of renormalization group, it means that when I try to expand the solution as a series, then Martin Harris strategy being inspired from renormalization group is to sort of subtract counter terms. You need to, in each term of the expansion, you have to subtract the counter term so that it becomes finite. So this is in the same philosophy as renormalization in quantum field theory. Now, for the disorder relevant case, what happens is that you just need to subtract uh, uh, finitely many counter terms in the expansion of the solution. But uh, when you reach dimension two, which is the marginal case, then you have to subtract infinitely many counter terms. So that is beyond the scope of the theory of regularity structure. So in physics language, the disorder relevant case is called a super renormalizable, while the marginal case is called a renormalizable. <coughs> okay, so uh, our approach in trying to study this disordered uh, relevant system is to, uh, so we sort of offer a new perspective on the study of this uh, disorder relevant system. So as I mentioned, disorder relevance means that when you zoom out or when you make the lattice spacing smaller and smaller, the effective strength of disorder actually blows up. So how do you get something interesting that is non-trivial? Well, naturally, one way to do it, that is, as you make the lattice spacing smaller and smaller, you can try to tune down the strength of disorder so that uh, the effective disorder strength now becomes stable <coughs> instead of blowing up. So therefore, if the model is disorder relevant, then it should be possible to tune down the strength of disorder down to zero at a suitable rate as you send the ladder space into zero, such that you get a continuum limit in the end, which also has non-trivial dependence on disorder. So that's a basic observation which motivated our study of disorder systems. Try to look at, look at things from this perspective. Yeah. <coughs> delta is the ladder spacing. So here, uh, instead of zooming out, I just make the ladder spacing smaller and smaller. Yeah, so the, I mean, you have a grid. So the length, the, the size of the grid is delta. Yeah. So this means that in the directed polymer, so this means that the time step will become, say, one uh, delta, and uh, the spatial co coordinate will become square root of delta. So which is equivalent to zooming out. I just make the ladder spacing smaller. So if the model is so relevant, then heuristically this suggests that it should be possible to send the ladder space into zero at the same time as I send down the strength of disorder to zero in a suitable way so that in the limits I get a continuing object which has non-trivial dependence on disorder. So that's the basic observation. And uh, so how do we, so this motivi motivates us to construct uh, continuing models which has non-trivial disorder dependence. So how do we construct uh, such continuing models well, the way to do that is through the partition functions. Because in equilibrium statistical physics, uh, the partition function is like a generating function. It captures essentially all information about the model. So therefore, one way to construct a continuum model is to see that if the partition function can be made to converge so that it has non-trivial dependence on some limiting disorder. So that's uh, what we uh, tried to study. Uh, so there are some previous results on this. So the first work of this type was by Albert Canning Castell for the directed polymer model in dimension one, spatial dimension one. And they found that if you rescale the strength of the noise, the inverse temperature as constant over n to the power one over four, where n is the length of the polymer, then the partition function actually converges to non-trivial limit. In fact, the limit is a solution of the stochastic heat equation that I wrote down. So uh, they didn't have the notion of disorder relevance, irrelevance that we uh, so that we're thinking about for other models. So after the paper, then we realized that uh, what they did actually is something that can be made much more general for disorder relevance systems uh, in general. So we developed, uh, developed a general criterion for when such models would uh, converge to, would be disorder relevant and have non-trivial continuum limits. And we applied this criterion for various models, including pinning model, and also the random field easy model. You take an easy model, you perturb it by external random field, and you can still do this uh, if the model is dim dimension two. Now, all this work for the disorder relevant case is based on so-called chaos expansions. Chaos expansions is some sort of expansion of the partition function in terms of these disorder random variables, which is uh, sort of some sort of, uh, you can think of it as some sort of tail expansion. 
uh, in stochastic analysis, analysis language, it means uh, it's called the Wiener chaos expansion. So it's a L2 orthogonal decomposition in terms of the disorder variables. However, this does not apply to dimension two. As I mentioned, dimension two, the model is marginal. So all these uh, results, uh, uh, they are restricted to dimension one. So this is where our current work uh, uh, came in. We want to look at uh, the two-dimensional directed polymer model and see that if we can still tune down the strength of disorder down to zero as you send the lattice space into zero, so that the partition function will have non-trivial limits. <coughs> so it turns out that one can still do that. So here the partition function, so, so you have to rescale the strength of disorder by constant over square root of the so-called overlap. So this turned out to be log n over pi for the two-dimensional directed polymer. The meaning of this is that if I just look at the two simple random walks independent of each other, I look at how many collisions they have on average by time n. That is the parameter I should, uh, the quantity that I should use. So that is like log n. So that is called the overlap of the two random walks. So you should rescale it by constant over this overlap, square root of the overlap. If I do that, then we proved uh, in the paper uh, in Journal of EMS that uh, the, partition uh, the partition function of the directed polymer actually converges to a non-trivial limit. And uh, interestingly, the limit actually undergoes the transition at the critical value where the beta hat was equal to 1. So remember what was the beta hat. Beta hat is this uh, prefactor here, below the, above the square root of n, square root of log n. So below the critical point, we can f identify what is the limit of the partition function. It's a law. The limiting distribution actually is a log normal random variable. It's the exponential of a normal random variable. While at or above the critical point, what we find is that the partition function converges to zero. So this is a transition that you discover for the directed polymer model. In dimension three and higher, such a transition is known. Such a transition occurs for just in the parameter of the inverse temperature beta without any rescaling. In dimension two, previously people just knew that the critical point is equal to zero. Our results show that if you look a bit finer, there is actually a transition on this particular scale. So that's our first result. Uh, identify the transition. Now, uh, you can also look at, uh, instead of looking at the, uh, the partition function at uh, uh, a single partition function. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Aren't you rescaling beta? Yeah, I'm rescaling beta, yeah, that's right. So that's why I call it beta hat. So that's why the parameter here is beta hat, and beta hat appears here, sorry. Beta hat appears oh, okay. here, that's the my beta. My beta is actually uh, the constant beta hat over square root of uh, log n over pi. <coughs> okay. So previously I've only talked about partition function of the random walk starting from the origin. But imagine that you can also start a random walk from a different point x, and then you run the polymer in this uh, same run environment. And then you can have a family of partition functions indexed by the starting time. So I can look at this family of partition functions with different starting sorry starting positions with different starting positions and think of it as a random field. Uh, previously, on the previous slide, I said what is the limiting distribution for each of these partition functions. But if I look at this family of partition functions as a random field then what we can prove is that actually as a random field, I center it by subtracting the mean, I rescale space diffusively, and I blow up things by a factor of square root of log n, then this random field actually converges to a limit as well. It converges to a Gaussian field. Now what is the limiting Gaussian field? It is actually the solution of the additive stochastic heat equation. Previously, the stochastic heat equation has this u times psi. Now there's no u, this is just uh, some constant times psi. So that is called the additive stochastic heat equation, and its solution is a Gaussian process. So in dimension one, it is, uh, I, think it's, uh, uh, I think it's just a Gaussian process. In dimension two and higher, it becomes a generalized uh, process, it means that it's a generalized function. It is no longer a function, it is just a random generalized function. So in dimension two, this is a random generalized function. So in physics language, this is called the edwards wilkinson fluctuation. <coughs> now, the corollary, there are also similar analogs of these results for the two-dimensional stochastic heat equation with additive noise, uh, with the multiplicative noise. Uh, 
the reason is because if you look at uh, the stochastic heat equation with uh, multiplicative noise, let me try to find it. Uh, this one here. If you look at this equation, then the usual way people try to make sense of this uh, solution of this equation, also for Martin Heron and all these other people, is to modify the noise in space. So you take the noise, which is a generalized function, you modify it in space with a CC infinity function. After modification, then the noise becomes smooth. Then you can make sense of the solution of this equation. And then you try to send the modification parameter epsilon to zero, and then try to add a sort of a counter term to uh, subtract uh, or divide by some large in diverging constant. And then you see if the solution actually converges as you remove the modification. So that's what people do. Now it turns out that by feynman katz formula, the solution of this equation admits a form that is similar to the partition function of the directed polymer model. So that's the analogy. So this is why our results for the directed polymer carry over fairly easily to the solution of the modified stochastic heat equation as well. So you get uh, something that is analogous. So here's a modification of the noise by this uh, CC infinity function. And then you have this modified stoch stochastic heat equation for which you can write down the solution in the very usual classical sense. And then you try to see that uh, uh, if uh, you remove the modification parameter, whether the solution converges to limit or not. So the solution is really analogous to the partition function of the directed polymer. So what you find that you converge to exactly the same limit with the dependence on the parameter beta hat uh, with the transition at the critical point beta hat equal to one. Uh, also you have the fluctuation of the solution if you regard it as a random field by centering it, blowing it up, you get this Edwards uh, Wilkinson fluctuation or Gaussian fluctuation. So there have been some results of this in dimension three and higher by, by these people. Now, <coughs> you can also draw some corollaries for the two dimensional KPZ equation. So what is the KPZ equation? The KPZ equation is an uh, equation that is related to the stochastic heat equation via the so-called Kohlhoff transformation. You basically, you take the solution of the stochastic heat equation with a multiplicative noise, and then you take the log. So that equation will satisfy this PD, stochastic PD. So the noise term will carry the same prefect, prefactor as you had in the stochastic heat equation, but then you also get this nonlinear term, gradient squared. So in general, if you don't have a modification, then h is a generalized function. Gradient h is another generalized function. Again, you have the generalized function squared. So mathematically, this is something that requires uh, to you to make sense of. So that's also what uh, Martin Harrer addressed. When you modify things, then everything makes sense. Uh, the question is that, is it possible to choose your c epsilon so that uh, the solution actually converges to a non-trivial limit? Now, our results for the stochastic heat equation by taking the half code transformation then it also means that uh, you have a transition at the beta critical equal to one, at least the point wise. If you look at the solution at each point, then you have this transition. Uh, also, you, uh, for different space time points, the solution converges to uh, ID normal random variables. Now, there is some recent work by Chatterjee and Dunlop where they look at a slightly different form of this uh, two dimensional KPZ equation where they put the small. Uh, factor not in front of the noise, but in front of the nonlinearity. So what they proved uh, in their paper was to show that when beta hat is sufficiently small, so this is deep in the subcritical regime, away from the critical point, what they proved is that if you look at the solution of this KPZ equation, you center it, then it is a tight family of random fields. So you think of this as a generalized function, then as a family of a random generalized function when you send epsilon to zero, this is a tight family, which means that it emits a non-trivial limit. It emits a, it emits a sort of weak limits as epsilon goes to zero. <coughs> uh, well, actually, the, equation, the solution of the equation they look at and the solution of the equation we look at, actually, they are essentially the same. The only difference is the prefactor of log epsilon to the power minus one, and then this constant. So essentially, these two equations are the same, just by change of variable. <coughs> Uh, so our results actually uh, would suggest point-wise the solution converges to no normal limits. A priori this does not tell you what is the solution like as a random field because as a random field you have a lot of averaging going on. So what happens at each point uh, may have no bearing on the solution as a random field. But at least it is sort of suggestive that the limit might be Gaussian. And this is actually something we are working on right now. In dimension three and higher, 
people actually have proved that the fluctuation of these random fields for the KPC equation actually is Gaussian deep in the subcritical regime. Uh, what I, when should I finish? Oh, well, it's supposed to be in field 510. 510, okay. <coughs> okay, so now let me discuss uh, briefly about uh, what uh, we know at the critical point. So previously, I've just explained uh, what is known at, uh, in the subcritical regime. When beta hat is strictly less than one, then we have the convergence of the partition function at each point. Uh, we also have a statement about the fluctuation of the partition function as a random field. But all this was for the subcritical regime, when beta hat was strictly less than one. Now the most interesting case will be what happens at the critical point beta hat equal to one. So what is known is that at the beta hat equal to one, the partition function converges to zero, right? So that's uh, what uh, I showed here. When beta hat is equal to one at the critical point, the partition function pointwise, each partition function at the fixed starting point for the random walk, this converges to zero. But you don't know anything else. So the question is that, uh, can you make something more interesting out of it? So one idea is to consider not the solution pointwise, but to consider the solution as a random field, again. So if you consider solution as a random field, then it turns out that indeed, even at the critical point, you have a non-trivial limits. In fact, uh, the critical point is not just the one critical point, it is in fact a critical window. You, cannot, you, can, do it not just, can, you can do it not only at the beta hat equal to one, you can actually add a second order term so that uh, in this whole regime, you still have non-trivial limits. So that's what we call critical window. <coughs> in the critical window, the partition function, they converge to zero, as I just uh, showed you. The expectation of the partition function is always equal to one, and the second moment of, of the partition function can be shown to diverge. Uh, all pre of previous techniques for the subcritical regime relies on L2 calculations, second moment calculations, so this uh, does not work anymore. Now, if you look at a random field, it means that I want to integrate, uh, integrate against test functions phi. So this uh, square root of n, it just means the diffusive scaling. One over n is just because uh, you have so many terms uh, in the square root of n box. So this is just the Riemann factor. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, partition function as a random field this way, then it turns out that there is non-trivial limits. Uh, first, let me recall some basic results. First of all, as a generalized, uh, as a random field, you can prove that on average, where I integrate out this order, it just converges to Lebesgue measure. So the mean field is just the Lebesgue measure. The variance at each point diverges. Uh, the covariance actually can be computed. If I take uh, two different points on the microscopic scale, I look at the covariance of the field. This actually converges to some limit that one can identify explicitly. The covariance diverges as you approach the diagonal. Uh, so these uh, calculations, first moment, second moment calculations, actually tell you that uh, uh, the variance of this uh, generalized field, this random field, actually converges to uh, the covariance uh, is given by this kernel k here. However, first and second moment calculation does not preclude the possibility that your weak limits are actually just a Lebesgue measure. The reason is because convergence of the second moment does not imply the, the limit is the second moment of the limit. Fatou's lemma only gives you inequality. If you have a sequence of functions where it's a second moment or the square, the integral of the square converges, and the function also converges, it doesn't mean that the limit of the square is equal to the, int uh, the integral of the second moment of the integral of the square of the limit. So therefore, if you want to say that the covariance kernel actually is the covariance kernel of the limit, you need uh, some uniform integrability properties, which means that you need to have to control the higher moments. So this is actually what we did in the recent paper. We are able to control the third moment. So here the partition functions are non-negative, so that's why it is uh, enough to just to control the third moment instead of the, of the absolute third moment. Now it turns out that, so once you have control on this, then this actually implies that uh, your random fields for these uh, partition functions gener generated by the partition functions at a critical point will have non-trivial limits. Every subsequential weak limit will have the same covariance kernel uh, 
that I wrote down on the previous uh, slide, this kernel k here. Uh, the only thing that we didn't resolve is to prove the uniqueness of the limit, because only knowing the covariance is not enough to characterize the limit. So we still don't know what is the limit. So that's a sort of uh, interesting question, what is the limit? Because there are not so many interesting examples of non-trivial limits in the continuum, uh, which are, which are uh, generalized functions. The standard examples we people think of are Gaussian free fields, or exponential of Gaussian free fields, which are called the Gaussian multi multiplicative chaoses. But the one we have is different from all those. First of all, it actually is a random measure. It's non-negative. And it has the same logarithmic divergence of the covariance kernel as you see uh, in the Gaussian, in the Gauss, uh, Gaussian free field. But uh, beyond the covariance, we don't have further characterization of this uh, limit. So that uh, is uh, the major stumbling block in trying to identify what is the limit and prove uniqueness of the limit. <coughs> Uh, no, that was for the subcritical regime. Oh, okay. In the subcritical regime, beta hat strictly less than 1, that was Gaussian. But for beta hat equal to 1, it is not Gaussian. <coughs> okay, you have similar results for the stochastic uh, heat equation. Uh, so uh, that is uh, where we are now. So let me just mention some, uh, in the last few minutes, let me just mention some related work. So the first related work is by Bertini Congrini with a look at the two-dimensional stochastic heat equation directly in the critical window that we consider. And they computed the limiting covariance kernel, but they couldn't uh, bound the higher moments, so they couldn't draw the conclusion that the subsequential limits uh, will be non-trivial. Uh, so that's what uh, we did in our work. <coughs> uh, then there is a work by a student PhD, a former PhD student of Crostell in Toronto, where they look at the directed polymer model in the same critical window. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, what is claimed in the abstract uh, is different from what it proves. In the abstract, it claims uh, that uh, the limit is non-Gaussian, and the proof actually proves that uh, did some moment calculations, sorry. The proof did uh, some moment calculations on the partition function, and by showing that uh, the third moment is somehow has some relation with the first and second moments, he came to the conclusion that the limit is non-Gaussian, except that there are two gaps in reasoning. First of all, the partition function converges to zero. So therefore, uh, the, what you look at when you look at higher moments is not really the interesting quantity. The interesting quantity is actually the log of this, which is going to minus infinity. So you have to center it first. So you cannot claim that this is normal just by looking at the moments of these uh, things. Secondly, uh, a gap in the reasoning is that the bound on the third moments. So the heuristic was to say that the third moment is bigger than the Gaussian, uh, the same Ga the Gaussian with the same first and second moments. But uh, Fatou's lemma actually tells you that uh, in one direction, if you get a bound in the wrong direction, then it does not tell you that the limit cannot be Gaussian. So he made a mistake on that. And uh, this guy already know this. Uh, he went to industry. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the referee pointed out, the referee, uh, the referee pointed out the mistake. But uh, he changed the statement of the theorem, but he didn't change the abstract. So the abstract still says that the limit is non-Gaussian. <laughs> <coughs> okay, uh, just a few problems to be investigated in the future. So one question, of course, is to understand that at a critical point, what is uh, uh, to prove that the limit is unique? So that is uh, open. And uh, also st try to study the limiting of the limit. Or if you cannot uh, identify the limit to say it's unique, at least uh, try to prove generic properties that can hold for all possible subsequential weak limits. So just to try to understand a bit more about the limit. And the more interesting question is to see that, well, we know that the partition function converges to zero at a critical point if I look at each individual partition function. Now, this does not mean that there is uh, nothing in interesting going on. Typically, what happens is that there is a possible choice of the scaling parameter an, which diverges so that it compensates. So, so when you multiply them together as a co correct normalization, then you can still get a non-trivial limit. So this is what we see for directed polymer on the tree. On the tree, this is what people do at a critical point, And the correct sc scaling is the square root of n. Here, we don't believe the correct, correct scaling is square root of n is probably square root of log n, but we have no idea on how to identify what is the scaling factor and what is the limit. And another point is to look at the log of the solution. 
when a log of the partition function. So when you look at the log of the partition function, uh, then log a n just uh, corresponds to the correct shift of the log partition function. So this uh, is a discrete analog of the solution of the two-dimensional KBZ equation in the critical window. So that would be very interesting from the point of view of the two-dimensional KPZ equation. Because so far, the only thing that is known for the KPZ equation is in dimension 1. As I said, in dimension 2, the model, the single SPD, is so-called critical, or in the renormalization language, is called the renormalizable. The theory for developed by Martin Harrow, etc., they do not apply. So if you can say something about the critical points, what is the solution of the KPZ equation at a critical point, uh, which is non-trivial, that would be very interesting. So. Uh, these are the questions one should invest investigate. Also, above the critical point, that is also interesting. Above the critical point, the partition function also goes to zero, but then the scaling will be still different. And whether you can say something about uh, the KP solution of the KPZ equation in the supercritical regime, that is also uh, will be extremely interesting. But we have no idea how to do that at the moment. So let me just stop. Sorry for.